Hello, welcome to Center Sundays. This is our May edition. Um, we're really excited to be here and talk with you all with some of our great programs that we've been doing every first Sunday of the month. We have been doing things related to our exhibitions, related to our residencies, and we're introducing a hybridization of programs that are happening on site, like art making activities, but continuing some of our programs virtually as well, so you can enjoy them from the comfort of your own home. Today, we're joined by Arina Zadev and Abigail Juan, who will be talking to us today about Irina's wonderful exhibition that we've been showing on our facade, uh, What Time Is It? I'll let her explain a bit more about this wonderful project. She'll be interviewing and having a conversation and painting with Abigail today. And let me tell you a bit about Irina. Irina Zadev is an artist, educator, and cultural organizer. They are queer post-Soviet Jew Jewish immigrant and settler on the unceded territories of the Three Fires Confederacy, Ojibwe, Adwa, and Patawatini, and also the Maya Amiya, Inoka, Ho-Chung, and Menominee, also known as Chicago, Illinois. Their practice explores the liminal space between the individual and the collective, diasporic community and chosen family, the home and the state. Irina aims to co-create joyful, healing, and liberatory spaces by, for, and with Black, Indigenous, and people of color, immigrants, young people, and LGBTQIA plus communities. Irina is a student of Adrienne Marie Brown and Miriam Kaba. Their highest intention is to practice emergent strategy and abolition within all aspects of their life. And with that, I'm going to introduce Irina. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for being here with us, Abigail. Thank you so much, Sierra and the Hyde Park Arts Center. Um, I used to live down the street from the center and it's always had a very special place in my heart. And I'm so excited to connect to you, Abigail, today <laughs> and to paint you and to learn more about your story. Um, I know Sierra wanted me to introduce the project a little bit, so I'll go ahead and do that. And then for the most part, you will not be hearing my voice. I really want to listen, paint. I might ask a few questions, but the show will be yours. Um, so to give a little bit of the background on this project, it was inspired by um, the work of Chinese American revolutionary philosopher and activist Grace Lee Boggs. Um, Grace Lee Boggs was born in 1915 and she lived until 2015. So she lived a hundred years. And in that um, lifespan, she did a lot of work around um, revolution and evolution. So like I said, she was an organizer. Her husband was Jimmy Boggs and he was um, an auto worker and an activist. Um, and the two of them did a lot of really pivotal work in um, the Black Power Movement rooted in Detroit. So they actually were so involved in the Black Power Movement that when the uprisings of 1967 happened, the FBI basically <laughs> accused them of starting those uprisings even though they were not in town. So um, throughout their life and their um, activism and their philosophy work together, they co-wrote a book. And in that book, they proposed this idea of time where they mapped the history of human evolution on a clock where every single minute was 500 years. And they would always ask, what time is it on the clock of the world? Because in, in our minds, we can get so focused on the experience we're having and what does it mean to really step away and consider the history of the world both before us and after us. So that's a little bit of an introduction to why, what time is it on the clock of the world? And of course, living during the pandemic, during you know these really powerful times of um, uprisings around racial justice, around police brutality, around healthcare and environmental justice, that question just felt very alive to me. So I've been painting portraits um, over the last year of artists and activists and healers and educators and young people and asking them to answer that question. Um, so with that, <laughs> I'm going to go on mute and I'm going to start painting. And Abigail, I would love to hear 
a little bit about who you are um, and what this year has been like for you. Yeah, the whole time thing is really deep. I'm like, uh-oh, holy cow, done. Like, but yeah, I feel like, so coming into high school for me, I like, so I came in right, I came into freshman year, right before the pandemic like started, like, I think it was almost like a perfect cut because I had like one of the um, best like eighth grade graduations, everything was like complete. And when I entered freshman year and started hearing more about this COVID case, I saw my middle school friends who were a year younger than me, their eighth grade, their eighth grade trip was like canceled. And a lot of things are just like postponed and everything. Everyone thought like at first everyone was like glad. I was like, oh wow, a two week break, right? And it was like, oh my gosh, this is the best. It's like almost like a winter break part two type of thing. But as things like quickly, we got more news about it, how this might not just be like a one month thing or even like just a three month thing. This was gonna be way more than that. And slowly we were like, I remember transitioning and learning from my like English class. We were just like sitting there and we usually talked to our teacher most about this because at that time our teacher was also our principal. But um, yeah, and he had to make the decision of whether or not to close the school or not, depending on COVID cases. I remember us as students, we were like, oh my gosh, we're gonna exaggerate this a little bit so we can have our you know, vacation, right? We were like, oh my gosh, so much work. And we just wanted to like have a break. And once we got that break, we were like, oh my goodness, it actually worked. We got our break. And we started, I think at first we had like a week off. And I was like, we were so happy. And then I think that quickly escalated to like two weeks off. And we we're like, oh, look, another week. And then we started remote learning. And we we're like, oh, what's this? Maybe, you know, just temporary things. I'll be gone in like a week or so. And we were like introduced to the Zoom. We were like, what is this? <laughs> we were like looking at each other's backgrounds. We we're like, oh my gosh, that's your bedroom. You like this? We actually got closer with my classmates and like teachers after seeing maybe some paintings or some like media that we see, maybe like some cartoons that we didn't know our teachers liked as a child, but they did. And we're like, what? You never told us type of thing. And yeah, we actually, our bonds grew, uh, grew closer. That was one of the positive things for me personally. But like, you, you start seeing on your phone, on the media, on news, seeing how there's like these strands that are, and you see more and more people getting sick. You see, more and more people dying you don't it starts to get more serious you start to pay more attention to the news and seeing how things have been severely worsened over time and I mean over time I was in the beginning I was very um, I started seeing how our schedules for school were the same as it was for like in-person school and that was just terrible. Oh my goodness. That it was, we were not used to sitting in front of a computer screen for like 12 hours a day. Cause you know, you got to add in the homework time that you had to sit there and do. And most of it was online because they can't hand out worksheets or like, like paper in general. You can't, they can't just do it on paper. You have to some, every single homework or assignment had to do something with your computer. And Luckily, I was uh, I went to a private school. I had a I won a scholarship before, and I was privileged enough to go into the school. But seeing how CPS schools were having like so, my school was considered one of the first responders, I guess, to this situation. They got the, they started noticing how severe this was and started planning since February. And when March hit, we went completely remote. Now the CPS kids, cause my little brother, he also went to CPS. He um, still went to in person. They didn't know how severe this was gonna be. They didn't know how bad it was gonna be. So they still kept going. And I heard there was like some cases that were going on in, within the schools. Like there were po um, positive COVID cases that were happening. And that's when you, you start like seeing like, oh, cause I feel like at first you feel like it's really a fog. 
it's like oh like this the state next to me or like just like new york and they're like new york's so far away from chicago but when then when it hits your like your sibling's school when your sibling's school you've like found out that they have a case there that's when you kind of just realize that oh this is closer to me than than i know i realized and so yeah but like at first i i was just really occupied with my own things i didn't know i didn't really have the time to think too deeply but i also really liked what one thing about quarantine that i really liked was how i how much time i had to reflect on myself and i personally think that i I had such major character development or like growth during this time because I had so much time to analyze myself and see and just um, observe what am I doing to help myself? What am I, what are my insecurities? Because I remember the time I was a major introvert. I did not like socializing too much. I was always seen as the little quiet kid in the background, but like, <laughs> but think over court I I slowly grew more confident I started building more self-esteem for myself and I remember having so many insecurities about my weight because I'm a dancer and often there are different costumes or maybe certain dances that like reveal a lot of your like skin and maybe you have a little like tummy pouch and that like kind of peels like just fills over and you know, in, in dance rooms or like in practice rooms, it's all mirrors. The entire wall is the mirror, so you always see yourself. And when you have other people, your dance, like your classmates in dance, and they look like they're in a much like more like toned fit like body than you, you start to compare yourself with them, and you realize like, oh, I don't, I don't look as perfect as, as them, or I don't look as good as them. And you start to see like, oh, what kind of, and you feel like you, that's where you start to criticize yourself more than others would. And maybe just like, yeah, also the media. Oh my gosh. I actually talked on Friday. We were doing this map mine uh, for, from the art center. And like, you were talking about like, so the previous assignment from last week was to make a mind map. And that's basically just like, focusing on one, I guess, topic of sorts in the category. And I chose the category of like the future of beauty and what defines it, right? Because I feel like, man, I, I feel like there's just so many things you can do with like talking with beauty. And so I chose that topic. And I think, let me, I don't even, okay, I have my sketchbook in my room, but I started off with like insecurities and beauty standards. Cause I feel like some of them overlap but they're also on like the polar opposites of the spectrum, I feel like. But I was finding way more um, insecurities than I thought I would. I was like, wait, this like, cause I was making like arrows. I was like height and weight. And I would go to like acne, stretch marks and scars and cellulite. There's so much that I like came up with that when I finished, I was like, whoa, how did I come up with so much? And like oh like and and then I was like all right let me move on to the beauty standards and seeing how it's, everything just has to be like perfect smooth skin you gotta have a nice like flat stomach you need to be you have to have a slim waist but you also need to have some curves and like hip dips were not considered I mean our beauty standards keep changing so I think hip dips were like unattractive and now they're attractive but you know maybe tomorrow they're unattractive again. Oh. And it's just like constantly changing. So I'm like, all right, this is going to be purely based on this month because I don't know what's going to be popping next month. So I was like, all right, this. And I was like, all right, men's beauty and women's beauty. And you know, I feel like for men, there's also a lot of like just double standards for them of how, like I didn't even get to like the emotional or like psychological part of different standards. Just only the physical beauty of it like height, like I always hear how men are kind of almost expected to be like six feet tall. And I'm like, genetics don't work that way. <laughs> You're not like, it's, and not everyone's gonna be six feet tall. Like, yeah. And it's just, it sucks to have that as a standard. 
it has like an expectation as something like a requirement for a lot of people who they're like oh yeah what do you look for in a, and you're like in your partner and if they're talking about a man they're like oh yeah I want them to be six feet tall like that's like one of the first thing that comes up and I'm like you're not even going to talk about personality of sorts and I'm like okay um but yeah like lo- like reflecting after that and seeing how many relations in different like ideas that I just because I was just like like a mind map that was just a brainstorming like little sheet that I did and seeing how I filled the entire page when within minutes it's kind of scary but yeah okay let me see where was I going back to um but yeah okay so back to quarantine and the beginning of COVID where I was so freshman, so high school was so very new. I think, so I, um, so this private school, I, in the freshman year, it was only 22 students in the entire grade. So it was an extremely small, small classroom. So everyone, I feel like you kind of get to know them personally. It was everything my middle school teachers told me about high school to be the complete opposite of. So that was not really a helpful guide. So I was kind of just heading in like, and just like I didn't know what to expect I like watched YouTube videos of just creators with their high school experiment experience and I was like this is not this is not how it's it's like does not match you know like there's gonna be so many people you won't even know what like half of them I'm like I know everyone I know (laughs) like everyone when I tell my like friends from other schools they're like you talk to your senior you talk to seniors and I'm like yeah I mean, there's like six of them. <laughs> so, and they're like, damn, you're like bold. And I'm like, they're like friendly. I feel like they're the same as us. They're just like only a couple years older, I think. But yeah, I mean, considering like Jones College Prep, a lot of my friends are from there. They have like thousands of students. And I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't talk to seniors if I already had like a good thousand people in my grade. I mean, I, I, there was just so many people. I'm like, yeah, I probably would not have my character development either because I feel like in this interpersonal space of my, my school, my class, you get to, I think you get to shine more than say in a setting where there's more people, right? And your teachers give, actually give you more attention. You actually get the teacher's attention more. And yeah, I actually, I was like, yeah, uh, this is a really good setting for me because I need, um, I actually really need the teacher's attention more. I remember in like sixth and seventh grade where I had major anxiety. I still do, but it's not as bad now. But before I would have to talk to my therapist every week about how school, because I was not doing too well. I was always too shy and feeling too judgmental, like for others, like you're judging me if I were to like ask this question and they're gonna think I'm stupid and such. And like the, the physical like body image of myself didn't help either. It was just everything I was just kind of ashamed of. And it's kind of, I now thinking back, it's kind of, I feel like that was just so far away and foreign just from how much I like grew as a person and yeah I can't believe that was just like a like a couple years ago like what I can't believe how much changed within you know maybe just like six months or seven months and this was like major growth too and I was like whoa but yeah I I just didn't I just didn't want to tell others about my problems I had like very close friends or like very few friends that I would consider close I also had like a bad history of people I would like a lot of friends I remember would like kind of betray me or like backstab me so I was very sensitive to making new friends or more friends because I feel like they would always like maybe like trust was always an issue to me I was like they feel like they're gonna like betray me in the end type of feeling and even if I try not to believe that it's always like that little like monster that comes back in the back of your mind that comes and like nags you about that and I also have like that feeling like when I'm feeling too happy or too excited I'm like it's terrible I I feel like something bad is going to happen and it's like this constant feeling of something bad is going to happen just it was it was so tiring to keep on running from it 
and trying to avoid it. So honestly, I feel like, I mean, not only me, I feel like a lot of people really needed quarantine as a time to reflect to themselves. Um, I feel like isolation, I mean, the word sounds very scary, but some, I feel like if you use it or do it in the right way, it can really benefit you for, as like, reflection. I feel like I'm using the word reflection a lot, but I think that was like the biggest thing that happened in 2020 and 2021 because I feel like it's just like it's such an underrated thing to do like not really not a lot of people do that because I think it's like it's a waste of time almost but I really enjoy that seeing now I mean I feel like I used to be one of those people's like reflection is gonna take too much time or something <laughs> but yeah I'm like I, I just like see more new and more value in certain things before that I did and looking at things from a different perspective um, but yeah, I also, with that new, like, self-esteem and confidence, I also started a lot of new clubs and a lot of new ideas within the school, because before I was a little afraid to just point them out or, like, just to give out the idea, and I mean, um, how many months ago, let's see, back in, I think, October, maybe, or December, I think, hmm, might have been January. I started the GSA club in my school and I became the founder and president there. Um, I was like, whoa, I mean, middle school Abby would have never done that. She would have never had the courage to do that. And having so many teachers and students and friends being so supportive of that was just like, it was so heartwarming. <laughs> but yeah, I also like joined student government and I'm like historian. I also joined the psychology club and it was just, I became a lot more involved. I was willing to socialize and talk to more people. But yeah, oh my gosh, but like with that journey came so, so many like, like inner battles that you can really tell others. You kind of had to like handle it yourself. Oh, that's also an issue of mine. I don't. I always feel like reaching out is kind of like a burden to me because I'm like, you can do it by yourself. I mean, it's almost like, um, I don't, it's like receiving help from others feel like it's going to be annoying to them. So I didn't do that as often, but realizing how, how harmful that is to me, first off, and second off, how many people would actually feel better if I were to actually like reach out to them. Because I feel like I was always, um, noted as that like that was very reserved and just I was a really reserved person I didn't didn't like to bother people <laughs> as of how I would think or maybe just reach out yeah but yeah it's just whoa how much I grew <laughs> but yeah opening a more serious topic of like I didn't I, I think like, okay, therapists, I feel like everyone so, should have one. They're so helpful to like just the vent to, or just like talk about your week too. I have um, I have a therapist that I talk to every week just to get my like weekly events out. Maybe my, like me, some like personal issues or problems or things are causing me a lot of stress. Oh my gosh, there was so much stress these past few months. I'll get into that, <laughs> but um. Yeah, I think therapists were so good. I had one since sixth grade. I've changed therapists, but they they just help you. Like I think you just really need someone to talk to. Everyone needs someone to talk to. And sometimes, you no know, friends, they're there for you. But like, oh, like I think you need one from a more third person type of feeling. Like someone that's not as close into a circle as you are. But yeah, <laughs> anyways. So the past few months, so I used to be in person in the start of, in the start of 10th grade, which is September of 2020. I went back into in-person because there's not a lot of people in this, in my school and they like separate it out. So each grade would come at a different time. So that's why I start school at like nine, 9.40 to like 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock is my first class. And I end around 4 or 5 p.m. And everyone else would have a different time. Maybe they'll come at 7, they'll come at 8. 
and so yeah I just like to space out everyone so no one comes at school like at, as a whole crowd and just rushes in because that's the last thing you want to do in a pandemic right but um yeah I was going in person but then I was I think I just had a sudden change of mind to go to remote because um my person I had like a really good friend a close friend who was online and even though we would like talk almost every day I was like I kind of maybe remote might suit me a little bit more because opposing from all my other classmates in freshman year actually I thrived in remote learning for some reason like I didn't know I thought I was going to struggle but I actually did really well that my teachers were emailing me. They were like, you know, I think I remember my math teacher was like saying like, um, it was a really cool line just sticks out to me. It was like, it was like, hi, Abby. Um, I just wanted to say that you were thriving in this uh, remote learning environment, just as you predicted. And I was like, they, they, that sounds so smart. I don't know why. That sounds like you would hear something from like a movie, like just as you predicted or just as you expected. That just sounds so epic, but <laughs> but yeah, I was like acing all my classes and I was, it was, I think all my classmates started to notice how I was more attentive and uh, a lot of my teachers called me very organized and I'm like, I guess I'm organized. I mean, some parts I am, like with my uh, sleep schedule, I remember I used to progress, I still procrastinate so much. Oh my goodness, that is a big issue for me. But how I fix that issue or try to like manage with that is since I procrastinate, I would like push my assignments way up like at night to do it, right? And that means I would not only like have bad quality work, but also have like terrible quality sleep. So I was like, all right, how about I put sleep first and then I'll do my assignments in the morning. At first, I was like, this is risky. What if I just don't wake up? I just like, good. I just wake up at like eight. So I'm like, all right, let, let's try this. And like, I was like, I was like, really like scared of waking up late. So I used to wake up at like 2 a.m. So I would sleep around. So I'd get off school, go home and just like pass out and just like sleep from. So that'd be around 6 to 2 a.m. So I get a good eight hours of sleep, right? And I would finish my homework. So I would wake up, maybe get a drink of water and then start with my homework. That actually worked better than I thought, but I remember I was like, I, I think finish my homework by three. And I'm like, so what am I gonna do in these three, four hours that I just have spared up? So after like readjusting, I would usually wake up around three to 4 a.m. Uh, depending on homework amount. Like sometimes like, if I just have like one or two assignments, I would wake up around five no problem. And then if I had more, it'll be like three or 4 a.m. But yeah, that was my thing. And then, because like, I feel like the deadline's closer and you're like, it's the morning. Like you don't, you can't really push that back, right? After after like 6, 6.30, you're gonna, you're gonna go to school now, right? And um, so that was my mental setup. I just try to put my, um, my work as close to the deadline. So I feel like my little mental like, I guess alarms like, hey, um, you kind of need to finish homework now because you know it's you're gonna get to, you're going to class in like an hour, but that helped me so much, and so that's kind of what I've been doing. But since school started a little later, I didn't really need to wake up as early, so now I wake up around six, and I would go to sleep around eight or nine. So I'm getting good sleep, and I'm finishing my work on time, and I'm like, that's the double win for me. <laughs> but, yeah, and I told my teachers about this idea and they're like, wow, that is, that's crazy. But that's also kind of ge like a little genius of you to do that if it works for you. And so I think that's where the organization part for them that they were describing came from, just like me like giving self solutions. But yeah, they also, I, I, don't know, I guess I'm really notable for my creative side. And I like to, I like to show that off. I love being a creative person. I love having new ideas and maybe even just involving more solutions from previous problems or just from other solutions, I would just make a new one or even better one. And yeah, I feel like in this society, that's really helpful. So I'm, I'm glad to have this trait. And 
think, you know, creativity comes from, I feel like, a lot of new experiences and memories that you've had or just like, yeah, just like different feelings. I'm a, very, I'm a really big person on like feelings, like I feel. So whenever I have those essays where you gotta write in third person, I struggle with those. Cause I was like, I feel this. And I'm like, wait a second, no, that's not how you're supposed to write it. But <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't know, I feel like a very interpersonal personality um, or vibe. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just, um, I don't know, I really like, I really, like talking about like feelings and such <laughs> but um yeah wait no oh no my train of thought <laughs> um but yeah just striving in general in remote learning and then in the start of 2021 I switched back to remote learning and I had, I think, a good th three friends online that were permanently remote. And then some other people, maybe they would like, they're feeling a little sick, so they would join us from remote. So that was the rule in for our school. If you feel sick, because every day you get your measure, your temperature checked, and like you would get asked if you have any symptoms, if you feel like, if you have a headache or such, because usually you would just like stay at home if you, if you do. And you can just join in from Zoom if you're, if you're still feeling like well enough to do that, right? But if you're sick, if if you if you're sick, you don't you don't have to do that. <laughs> but um, yeah, and so that was the journey until like everything was like all right, like remote learning was pretty stable. It was like the same thing as like last year. And then like, I think the conversation of like hearing from my family from Taiwan and started to hit how my grandmother was struggling a little bit with her memory. So she was, um, at first it was all right, but then you, I, family members were getting more worried because when they visited my grandmother, because she now lives alone, she would like often forget some things and like a quick, mo like a really quick moment sometimes she would forget like what even the doctor said for her when she goes to the hospital and she would have to go back to ask again. And then when she goes back, she, she comes back home, she forgets. And there's like some other things like maybe she forgets to like close the front door, but like luckily um, Taiwan is a very, very safe thing. Like I, like a lot of people like walk out at night with ease and it's such a, that's like a culture shock. Um, I, I was like not expecting to like feel like, cause I feel like also the nightlife here is very popular. So you still have like a bunch of events. Like there's like a night market where you have like, it's like, like street food. And then there's like little like arcade games outside that you could play. It was almost like a festival at night, right? So it was like, it was like a party. So you, you often still see people walking around around like 11 p.m. and you're like, oh, okay, we're so safe. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I was like, oh my goodness, that's, and I started like talking to my mom about it because it was uh, my mom's side. And so I was like, maybe, I mean, we could take this chance of me still being able to be remote, right? Because like next year I know I'm going to be in person for sure. So I'm like, all right, let's take this chance. Let's take on this challenge almost of like sending me back to Taiwan. I remember like not knowing, I was talking to my Mandarin teacher in, uh, in school and I was like talking to her through Zoom. I was like, I might, I might go to Taiwan, but I'm not sure when or how, because I couldn't even give them like a percentage. I was like, it's a very 50-50, like I either go or I don't, right? Um, and it was scary because like I'm traveling alone, let alone I'm also traveling in a pandemic. And also this is like a completely different language, right? So my Mandarin is all right. I I can speak it, I can like listen to majority of it, but the writing and the reading is something I struggled with because I feel like as born as an uh, um, Taiwanese American like student, um, you don't really, you don't really get to use that that culture side of you unless you're at home but like if you're like like someone who spends majority of the time exposed to american media and just using english as their primary and dominant language at school and seeing how you spend school like for like 70 percent of my 75 percent of my life already 
it's kind of hard to associate that like culture with you and especially how I, you probably got like bullied or like kind of like picked at for their culture like that was an issue as well where I was like remember when I used to bring my own lunch I would get like, picked for my food I was like yeah and I remember they would like say how what is that and like oh it's kind of a weird smell and I'm like yeah and so I remember I like switched to like sandwiches because I, I I just did not want to get like I didn't want to get picked on again for what I was going to eat and it's kind of sad because I, I missed out on a lot of things I could have like done and I that ultimately I feel like that might have been like the first spark of my uh how to say maybe my personal like um self-shame I guess I would say I would criticize myself like oh yeah why aren't you like them why why am I not like them why do I not eat the same food as them like because that's like a nine-year-old you wouldn't you wouldn't know how to process that you wouldn't know why you're different and everyone else everyone else kind of had the same thing and you were the one you were the odd one out and obviously you know in such a small in, in this like I guess psychological like uh room of sorts you would you would ultimately you wanted to blend in you wanted to be like everyone else it feels feels weird and feels uncomfortable to be the one that's the only one that's different and you not knowing why I mean now you know maybe if you're different you're seen as more unique and you have a more um extinctive like flavor to you or something like that but before you're just like what why what's like what's wrong with me type of feeling and um yeah that was terrible oh my goodness but yeah, back to the main story I like planned out I was like because there was a lot of things where was, I had to do first I had to get my COVID tested and I had to get it twice just in case um one of them because I had to do like 72 hours before the my flight so that was so scary because I didn't get my results until like what six hours before my flight oh my god my heart was like because I was like am I gonna miss my flight what's happening what and like it was it was terrifying because like you couldn't just get your um COVID result like a week before because they were like no that's kind of like not accurate anymore they want it exactly 72 hours before or around that hour and then like I think my they said my COVID results were lost in like like my data and I'm like what <laughs> and I was calling them while I was having my class I'm like all right I, I have a call to make really quick like my my sports science class I was like this is this is in my um with my like COVID stuff because I, I had to tell my teachers I was going right so yeah the amount of stress that was going on that week I was oh I was not doing well I was like I remember also it was like weeks before I was already stressed out but then at that point I was so I've been just so stressed out and so tensed out that I was too tired to be like more stressed at that point it was exhausting I felt like mentally dead and like the packing situation I couldn't even do because somehow just you know coincidentally that week was also a lot of week, uh, a lot of tests and presentations that I had to get ready for as well so I had like I was like so what am I supposed to focus on my school or for like my flight okay now I got like two priorities I need to do so my health which is pushed it down my mental health was pushed down even more it was not healthy <laughs> um I continued on and I ended up like packing mostly so I think I packed a week before for my clothing but for like my main stuff I packed a good six hours before my flight was <laughs> was gonna bore because <laughs> I was like all right I need to finish my school stuff and it was also, so since the time difference, right, it was Wednesday night, the Thursday morning. So it was Wednesday's midnight and I didn't hear that. So my, like my, my mom and I, I thought it was like Thursday night, but it was Wednesday night. <laughs> so I was like, I like learned this like a, like a three days before. I was like, what? Cause like the communication was just thrown off. Cause she was saying like, um, Wednesday night and wait I was she was saying like Thursday night which was supposed to be 
Wednesday night because the midnight it's kind of it's kind of confusing right because so the term I used it was like uh, Wednesday night Thursday morning because it was right between it's literally it was like my flight was right at like midnight but um yeah oh gosh um yeah so I had to like say goodbye to my cat which I I, I still miss so much <laughs> I'm such a cat person and like she's like such a big comforter for me whenever I'm stressed out so yeah it's kind of it's kind of bad not having her around to like comfort me but yeah I mean I, I was like oh my gosh I was like I remember I was like um I was most, I was like missing, I felt like I was going to miss my cat the most <laughs> out of everyone. And they were like, I, I, I can't, actually, I was proven to be correct. I do miss my cat so much. <laughs> and sometimes I would call my mom and I'm like, hey, can you get the cat on? Just like to face the camera on the, when we're like video calling. And I'm like, hi, <laughs> type of thing. Um, but yeah, so the flight came and Oh yeah, um, I never been on a flight by myself. So all the legal work and all that like flight information was all dealt with for my mom, um, or like my dad, like one of one of the adult, like one of my parents, right? I wouldn't. I was just like, whoa, Adventure Time type of thing. Like, like oh my gosh, like we're so high up in the plane. Now I was more, you know, grown up. It was like very like adult stuff. <laughs> And I was having this like whole folder of information I needed to hand in because, you know, added on to like having a normal fight experience, you also had like the pandemic's info that you needed, your like COVID tests, your, um, maybe your hotel that you're quarantining in. Oh God, yeah, that stuff. Um, but yeah, and most of them were in Mandarin too. I could not read that. So my mom would have like little notes written on the side, like this is your COVID test results. This is your um, taxi information. This is your hotel information and how to get to your hotel and how to communicate with your taxi driver. Cause they had like specific ones that you had to drive that had to take you there. Cause you can like contact anyone else and like out of, um, out of the airport, I guess. Just as so, cause like you're almost like, um, how is it? You're almost like, how, I don't want to say like suspected of having COVID, but you have the potential of having COVID, right? And traveling to another country, that's very dangerous. And yeah, I was like, I knew I was going to have a huge risk of potentially getting COVID as well. And I, I remember like, I haven't been outside in four months. I have not, I have not been outside of this house. I usually in my room because I have to like, you know, classes are always on, on, on my, you know, on your computer, on your laptop. So I really only out, went out of my room for like bathroom breaks or like for some food, going to the kitchen. That's about it. I had to like do my homework in my room and such and such. Because my brother around that time, yeah, my brothers were also at home. So he was in the dining table. <laughs> so he would, he would, I usually just see him with snacks all the time. But yeah, oh yeah, my brother is, he just turned 10, I believe, like last week. So yeah, he was like a nine-year-old. It was terrible for him because I feel like terrible for all little kids. It's, it's, it was hard for me to sit still for like 10 hours a day, let alone for little children to sit still, like in just one seat and staring at the computer. How are you, I don't know how they expected children to learn just from like sitting like this where you just see like high schoolers and college students or where you're kind of like dozing off. And yeah, I, I'm just like, kudos to like grade, like elementary students who have to do this. And like, some of them don't even know how can like laptops work yet, right? They don't know how technology works. Like I was like, how, how the heck did Zoom work at first, right? I was clicking random buttons. I don't know, sometimes they get kicked out randomly and I'm like, what, what just happened? And they're expected to like learn in this environment. They're expected to learn, know how to like get back into the Zoom, which class, which link. And I'm thinking back, me as a nine-year-old, what was I? I, I was not doing that stuff. I was, you know, I was kind of just like still like maybe just like riding my bike after school or something. I, it was very like little kid test type stuff. And they're expected to know how to reply to emails. 
and like like forwarding emails like I just learned the other week or so how to like BBC people because I was just, like taught that and I'm like oh, I'm, I have a six and a half year difference age difference with my brother so for him to already know had like had to have the same knowledge of how to work emails and just things like this and I'm like this is terrifying what how do you know this stuff <laughs> And like, wow, like turning in homework, like digitally and knowing going to the right classroom online, what? I, what? <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm just amazed. That is truly something I would probably never have known how to do as an elementary kid. But yeah, oh my gosh. So getting to, so on hey, the fly. Abigail, I sorry, that. I don't mean to interrupt you. Thank you so yeah. much for sharing. You're such an amazing storyteller. I feel like I could keep listening to you for hours. I just glanced at the clock and I was like, oh, I think this session is supposed to end. So oh, yeah, it's really fast. <laughs> so um, I just really want to thank you for your time and of sharing course. about your experience. And I just want to ask you um, that Grace Lee Boggs question that I've been asking everybody which is what time is it on the clock of the world? How would you answer um, that? Well, okay, so. <laughs> um, in the abstract point of view, if it was like, what time is it for me personally of where my, I can think my uh, mental state is, I would say, like it's kind of a roller coaster. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of up and downs throughout this journey that just not even up and downs, there's like side and just so many different emotions I experienced throughout these past few months that it's oh, it's like exciting, but it's also so mentally exhausting at times. But yeah, I mean, um, throughout this, like, I feel like this whole adventure of mine I would like to say I'm hoping that there's like something there that I can maybe pick up and learn from and maybe use that in the future type of feeling <laughs> yeah hopefully that answered your question <laughs> yeah thank you I love that image of the roller coaster and it definitely aligns with everything you've shared of your own personal development but then mm -hmm. the fear of not knowing what's happening and going all the way across the world, but also having like a very personal and introspective journey in addition to all the things that are happening. Globally. Right. Yeah. Um, I just have one last question for you and it's about your portrait. So I always mm -hmm. ask folks um, what you would want for your background. It can be anything real or imaginary. There are um, no limits. So how would, how would you, what kind of universe would you like to be in? Whoa, okay. Um, I kind of want to have like a sunrise type of background. Um, but I kind of want to have it not very realistic almost. I kind of want to have an imaginary setting, like a very fantasy type uh, background. Having, yeah, because I feel like the sunrise kind of just like a new day, a new hope type feeling, like a new adventure like whatever mistakes you did are now like behind you type of thing. And you can always change that today and you're looking towards the future type of thing. So that's why I like sunrises. And also like, I feel like that coordinates with my sleep schedule, like waking up and seeing the sunrise. Not anymore though, cause it's like, I wake up and it's already dark, <laughs> but, <laughs> but before, yeah. I love that. That's so cool. I'm gonna have so much fun painting this. Um, mm -hmm. I want to say thank you to Sierra and the Hyde Park Arts Center for connecting us. And I mm -hmm. would definitely love to stay in touch and just hear more yeah. about your journey in Taiwan. And I'll reach out to you um, when the portrait is done and share it with you. Nice. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. So good to meet you. This was so much fun. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope you enjoy your journey. Do you know when you're going to come back to Chicago? Yeah, I'm going to come back August 8th, I believe. So just a few months. <laughs> well, enjoy the rest of your trip. I'm sure your grandmother is so <laughs> grateful to have you there. 
And thank you for getting up in the middle of the night <laughs> to join us for this. Thank you, Sierra, for doing all the behind the scenes work to make this happen. And thank you to the Hyde Park Art Center for supporting this project. Yes, thank you so much for doing this with us here today virtually. I think something that's been really cool about virtual programs is that you can transcend geography. So mm -hmm. being able to be in a conversation with you, Abigail, while you're in Taiwan and have it be so yeah. connected to what Irina's project is talking about and how people's lives have changed and time has changed. So thank you so much. We definitely want to let you go so you can get to bed. It's very late. Um, but. Thank you all for joining us for our Center Sunday. Uh, please check out more information about this project and more about Irina and her practice as well. And Abigail is one of our, our CHOP teens. So we have teen programs that we do at the Hyde Park Art Center as well as art classes and all kinds of things. So you can check us out at hydeparkart.org for more information about both of those things. Thank you and have a great Sunday. Bye. Thank you, take care. Bye. Bye.